Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast by Bangalore International Centre. In February and March 2021, we are approaching another set of elections in various parts of the country. Four large states of West Bengal, Assam, Kerala and Tamil Nadu, along with the union territories of Jammu and Kashmir, Ladakh and Puducherry, all have their assembly elections this summer. Hi, I'm Pavan Srinath and welcome to BIC Talks. On this episode, we have Jawhar Sharkar and Siddharth Raja talking about the political dynamics and the backdrop to the elections in the most populous of these states, West Bengal. They go beyond the immediate electoral dynamics and this episode is a masterclass on Bengal's politics. Mr. Sharkar is a public intellectual and a retired Indian civil servant. He served as the Secretary of the Ministry of Culture of the Government of India between 2008 and 2012 and was the CEO of Prasar Bharti from 2012 to 2016. Siddharth Raja is a lawyer and a historian from Bangalore and was previously here on BIC Talks on episode 34 to talk about the Nandi Hills and its rich history. Hi Mr. Sarkar, it's a pleasure to have you on BIC Talks. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Siddharth, uh, it was great to have you as a guest last time and it's a pleasure to have you as a host this time. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Pawan, and thank you, Mr. Sarkar, for what promises to be a very interesting session indeed. I'll actually get straight to it and we are going to be talking today in conversation with Mr. Sarkar about the elections in Bengal that are forthcoming. And before I hand the floor over to him, I thought I'd just set some context. Uh, the way I look at it is we will be addressing that issue in three broad buckets today, looking first perhaps at the current and the immediate past, an overview of the political and electoral landscape throughout the state, what I'd call a stratified view, not just of Calcutta, but perhaps West Bengal in total. And then just do a quick introductory analysis of key areas and districts, perhaps, and move on to what I would consider the meat of this session, which is identifying and analyzing the various factors or issues that arise in this election and end the session with a forecast on outcomes, not so much a predictive analysis of who wins what, but what this election means for the state and for India as a whole, a more thematic kind of impact analysis, which we will come to at the end. I'll begin by, you know, just perhaps giving the context and asking him to give us an overview of the political and electoral landscape that exists at present throughout the state. You know, the fact that Bengal, West Bengal has 295 MLAs that are coming up for election. What, what exactly would you, Sarkar, view as some of the key aspects of this political and electoral landscape uh, in the state. You've mentioned 295. It's actually 294. One is a nominated seat. 294 uh, seats up for elections. And uh, I'll just set the context with Karnataka. Now, 294 seats is West Bengal's electoral prize. Karnataka has 224 seats, little less. Now, let's compare the populations so you get a hang of what we are dealing with. West Bengal has a population of 9.3 crores. Karnatak has 6.1 crore. So either way, it's uh, either 150% that way or you can look at the other way. The relation is that 6 is to 9. Now, 6 is to 9, the interesting part is that Karnataka's area is more than double of West Bengal. More than double of West Bengal. So that's why when you look at this chicken-like state, the thin, compressed, very odd-shaped chicken-like state, we have to realize that it's highly packed. It's a very, very dense place and has always been dense because of the intense fertility of the soil and many other factors. Even though West Bengal looks like a little slice of shredded chicken or something, it actually has a population bigger than many other states. Having said that, the density is also pretty high, as you can realize. 
Now, that's one factor we must remember that it's a highly densely populated state and there are more urban and semi-urban issues than in other places. Now, what are we talking about? Well, West Bengal is facing elections along with three other states. The three major states that are facing elections with West Bengal are Assam, which is quite important in terms of citizenship and other issues. We have Kerala, where you got to see who makes it. You have Tamil Nadu and we have West Bengal. I think Puducherry also comes in. This is the beginning of the landscape into which we are entering. Now, the issue that has excited the attention of people all over India is whether the BJP, that was the dark horse in the state, whether the BJP is about to grab it or putting it more optimistically where they are concerned, whether they have actually got over the state, whether they have captured the state and the election is going to be a mere ritual. So that is the prime concern. Has the state been taken over or about likely to be taken over? Just before we get into the facts that are relevant to today's situation, you know, I was looking at it that West Bengal has perhaps a fairly unique track record of the longevity of its governments and its uh, chief ministers, right? For the last 44 years, we've only had three chief ministers in the, st- in the state, while in the 15 years prior to that, there were, you know, a number of governments going in and out, right? The Bengal Congress, the Ajay Mukherjee governments, the 15 years from 62 to 77, leading it to, you know, four chief ministers in the state. So, in that context, if you, you know, helped unpack the situation, so to speak, and I'm glad you mentioned about the BJP uh, and, the, the, and the dark horse that is the BJP. So, perhaps we could get straight into those factors or issues that arise in this election. And, you know, in the context of The fact that the governments in West Bengal have been, you know, as I said, the longevity of chief ministers have been pretty high. Talk about the identity politics that might emerge in this election and what it means for the stability of governments and governance in general. Perhaps we can begin there and then start to unpack some of these these issues, because as you rightly said, it's a it's almost a capturing exercise. Is this going to be uh, the BJP breaching a bastion? Uh, very much like what Mamta Banerjee did in 2011 when she breached the left bastion after almost 33 or 34 odd years. Over to you, sir. Before we come to that, let me uh, clarify. Bengal has had uh, chief ministers who have had rather long tenures. The period that you were referring to is what was known as a greatly unstable period between 1967 and 72 when the left first surfaced and it was promptly put into the back into Pandora's box and the lid shut and then the surfaced again. So that time we had quite a few temporary chief ministers as we call it. Before that, for the largest period between 1847, 48 and 61, we had B.C. Roy. And then if you skip the warring period, Then you had Siddharth Sankar Ray for five years, which is not too great. And then you had Jyoti Basu for about almost 28 years, followed by Buddhadev Bhattacharya, who also was there for about seven years. So that's been the profile of Chief Minister. And now you have Mamta Banerjee from for the last 10 years. In the last election of the 294 seats, the TMC got 211, which is quite a lot. 211 out of 294. They had actually added 27 seats from their first previous tally. The BJP, why I called it a dark horse, got three seats out of 294. So where does the where does the contest where where is, is the problem? What is the problem? How does BJP jump up from three to chief ministerial ambitions to capturing the state? I'm not discussing the left and the Congress. The left and Congress put together got around 70 seats because both were declining forces. The vote percentage is equally interesting in the last election. The TMC got 45 percent of the popular mandate, which is pretty high. The BJP spread its candidates all over, 
though it got three seats only, it managed to get 10% of the popular vote. Now, this doesn't look greatly challenging. And you must remember the 2016 elections are two years after the Modi wave swept Bengal. And in 2014, though the BGP managed to make get two MP seats out of 42, it didn't make much of a dent. So we are talking in a post-Modi situation. Even in a post-Modi situation, the BGP was nowhere in 2016. Okay. Fast forward to the 2019 polls. The 2019 Lok Sabha polls are being taken as some sort of a referendum. The 2014 one was not taken as a referendum. This is taken as a referendum because the Trinamool Congress or the TMC lost 12 out of its 34 seats. It came to 22 and the BJP caught up. It got a mighty 18 number. From nowhere, two seats to 18 seats was indeed a big pole vault. And not only that, in terms of vote, they caught up. In the last election, the TMC had 40% popular vote. And in 2019 Lok Sabha, it's not an assembly election, Lok Sabha election, 2019 Lok Sabha election, BGP got 40%. That means BGP caught up with the TMC. Mercifully for the TMC, its vote share went up from 40 to 43. So it got about three and a quarter percent, 3.3 percent higher than the BJP and managed to get four more seats higher, the four seats higher than the BJP. At one point of time when the results were being declared, it was up on the screen for quite some time, the TMC 20, BJP 20, 2020. I mean, they were neck to neck. Finally, in the last count, it became TMC 22 and BGP 18. I mean, many people in the TMC may have had heart problems at that point. So this is a scene. So with this scene where the BJP has secured 40% of the popular vote, which is very high, and the TMC has 43%, the seats are almost close to each other. The next election, that is 2009, uh, 2021, looks very, very interesting. So, I mean, it's, if I can just come in there quickly, sir, so it's clearly indicating a tectonic shift, right? That is, over the last two elections, both at the state level as well as in the Lok Sabha elections, has clearly been that shift, as you, you know, very well pointed out. So, you know, in the context of this tectonic shift, what is this role of identity and religious or faith-based politics that seems to go against the very grain of what Bengal has perhaps stood for for the longest time, which is secular values across society and the political spectrum. Let us, if you can help us unpack that a little bit. To understand Bengal, you have to understand the Bengali people as a whole. You see, while the rest of India looks only at West Bengal, the Bengalis look to both Bengals. Bangladesh is a foreign country to all of you. It is a foreign country to us as well. But the fact remains that the people of Bangladesh eat the same food, excepting one item on their dish. They absolutely the same food. They speak absolutely the same language with a twang of their own twang. And they think we speak Bengali with a twang. Doesn't matter. And same identity at one point of time, the same rituals as well. So when these two areas, the two parts of Bengal were partitioned and one became a part of Pakistan, East Pakistan, it took away a lot of Bengali speakers. In fact, the largest number of Bengali speakers of Bengali identity people are in Bangladesh. We have our differences also because of uh, various factors. The Partition was on religious lines and whatever little bit of cosmopolitan was left on both sides got hardened 
as the indian pocket politics in india and pakistan started becoming more and more parochial why i'm mentioning this to you is to understand the bengali way of looking at things 66% of the bengalis are in bangladesh so we get about 34% in <coughs> bengal i mean that way 66% of the bengali people are muslims so if you look at it if it was an undivided state we would be a muslim state west bengal is the predominantly hindu majority part so west bengal is the hindu majority part but it has one of the largest muslim percentages percentage of muslim population so west bengal has around 29 30% muslims so you can understand the spread of islam which has been taken in very naturally in in the history of bengal indigenous people a lot of autochthonous people a lot of people at what one would say the bottom of the pyramid and it's a very big broad bottom of the pyramid to islam bangla is a bit of a class also in that but in the hindu faction the hindu part of the bengali people also have a lot of depressed caste which means you have to understand if you go back retrospectively that at one point of time casteism or the caste hierarchy was so so stark that you had only around 5 to 10% at the top then about <coughs> another 8 or 10% as a so called middle caste and then the rest of them were taken as depressed and out of this rest the largest faction the largest part moved on to islam so you get me so when a bengali says that we don't have casteism and we don't have caste problems why well, you solve their caste problems by getting them to move to islam ajor you have picked up you you have identified several important issues and i'm going to pick up on two this whole idea of bengali subnationalism right and i hope i'm pronouncing this right i think it's called bohirgoto right now that sweeping bengali subnationalism or is it a sweeping of the bengali subnationalism how does that interplay with this rise of hindutva if i can call it that the religious faith based politics that's question number 1 or issue number 1 and how did the confident and liberal bengali start feeling so aggrieved as to embrace this kind of disgruntled brand of politics if i can call it that or the very brazen kind of politics now i know i am adding a lot of my own values into this but uh, those are the two broad questions bengali subnationalism or bohirgoto versus you know hindutva and the liberal bengali and we'll come on short to the issue of the bhadralok and 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 all of that in a bit but um, if you could help again unpack some of these things uh, in the context of the past in bengal and what it means today that would be really great you see it's very painful to even hear about it because much of it is not true much of it is not true and i can say that with authority let me put it this way number 1 this is one state that had never had a state movement had never had a state movement you can show me one state in india that did not have a state centric party every state had it the only state that never went in for a state centric party or rejected the state centric party there was an amra bangali or some stupid uh, group that had come up and they were promptly rejected so when it comes to bengali nationalism on the basis of language it's there it's not there in the sense that the bengalis are extremely proud of their language i keep reminding them that it is one of the last languages to develop and they look look quite fiercely at me but whatever be it the bengalis are very fond of their language and when i say bengalis i'm referring to bangladeshis as well are extremely fond of the language more than any others they lost their lives for it which explains why 21st february is international language day so they have it and it goes to absurd limits of insisting on speaking in a bengali accent irrespective of what language they are speaking you know what i mean i'm not going to pursue that point so heavy is the accent on them but but when it comes to 
subnationalism it's a word that's been coined in the last few months or a year at the most a couple of years because the lady in charge often started making a few statements about azande 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 now while most people do not subscribe to such narrow views i would ask you to look into yourself and tell me what would the people of bangalore or bengaluru feel if the opposition politics were completely led by mulayam singh by yogi adityanath by nitish kumar the only faces about opposition politics in karnataka that you see are these people who come in every week and tell you what's wrong or what's right so we have to realize that the bjp is bringing in its star performers all of whom are from outside what does it show it shows that its local roots are not that strong it hasn't produced leaders of consequence among the local people when i say local when you local i mean people local and they could be agarwal they could be mishra they could be anything they could have come from any state and settled but they are part of the identity of bengal in fact at the at the district levels when you go around you'll see that almost everyone who's there in in some sort of a position of eminence was once an outsider so to say in other words a settler but having said that he or she is taken as a 100% bengali today okay so what this lady might be trying to put across her expressions are not the best is that why can't you have leaders from within the state okay i'll give another example supposing Uh, the people who talk about bengal is being prickly about leaders coming in from outside how would lucknow look if the campaign in lucknow the opposition campaign in lucknow were led by stalin and yadurappa you get my point so there would be this natural feelings come up and that is not poisonous parochialism that's the first point i'm making the second point is that they have a support base which is growing among a small section of imported up country businessmen and traders that is becoming very very eye catching this particular one and uh, the symbiotic relation between this small group who still speak in their mother tongue which is very good they should speak in the mother tongue and they don't need to speak any other tongue but there is this sort of a eye catching or a glaring thing coming up and you can't sort of avoid it airbrush it away so both sides have contributed to this bengali subnationalism branding but i frankly feel that that is not a major issue she is only trying to capitalize and say look all the leaders are from outside and i guess any politician would do it if the opposition party's leaders were all from outside so i mean by that logic then you know on the basis of what she's mentioning the appeal is perhaps more stark in the case of the bjp because then in order to overcome any potential negativity from that subnational kind of feeling is to push the card of hindutva to push the card of of the religious identity right i mean of course the thing that we've been seeing in the news re- recently is if if i can't shout jai shri ram in this state will she go ahead and do it in in pakistan right and how much does that appeal to the to the electorate both you know urban and rural you did also mention about the divisions that exist in bengal on those lines it is heavily urbanized in some sectors but also a rural port base so by that logic i mean the two points i'm asking is essentially one the subnationalist blunting is done through hindutva right to appeal to another issue and uh, you know there may be a stratification if i can call it that in the way in which urban bengal reacts to that the more edu- the more educated the more secular the more bhadralok 
as opposed to the rural voter? And perhaps that's another issue we can come to. Your thoughts, sir? You have framed your questions rather provocatively, Siddharth, but each one is worth attending to. Number one, returning to the insider-outsider issue, I'll explain how, how it feels. The Bengalis, as I said, love their language, maybe a little excessively. The entire campaign of the BJP is in Hindi. Are you getting me? So that sort of a thing, that is, and now if you accuse the state of not being good enough to like love Hindi, it's perhaps not fair. They can try it out in Tamil Nadu beyond a point. Let's put it quite firmly. So it's being done. So the insider outsider is mainly based, I mean, primarily based on who's speaking what language. And they are coming every day, every day. I mean, I think Amit Shah left two days ago. He's coming today or tomorrow. Mr. Modi is coming day after tomorrow and goes on like that. So the fact is that their entire volley is coming from outside. Their entire nine out of the 11 players are coming from outside has generated this sort of a thing that a local politician will not miss. Okay, second comes the symbolism. You see, religion in Bengal is celebration, has always been celebration, there have been social gatherings, yes, with a bit of bit of ritual and piety thrown in for good measure. But it's not centrally focused on, let us say, the worship per se. So the popular deity of Bengal, as everybody will know, is Durga. And it's a very Bengali Durga that comes in with a family, an appropriate family as to that. I mean, you can't go and challenge somebody from Odisha saying, why do you have Jagannath? So it, it is the equivalent of Jagannath Durga. Ram has no issues in, in the state. In fact, as I pointed out in my writings, of all the states that Ram visited with so much care, his two deity does not show Bengal which may be one reason. So it's just absent. So I'm not saying that Ram is disliked or anything. Ram is very much a god, but a god in his own way. I mean, like he, he's not a box office hit in this state. So, and when you take up an issue like that and say that I, I, I'm i saying Jai Shri Ram, if you're a good Hindu, if you're a Hindu, you say Jai Shri Ram. The response in Bengal is, we are Hindus and we are Muslims. We don't wear it on our sleeves. For God's sake, we don't wear it on our sleeves. And we are not in the habit of sort of shouting, Jai Durga, Jai Durga, or Jai Ma Kali. We do it at perhaps on the day of the festival. That's all. So that would apply to any other god or goddess uh, who is available for politics. The name of any god in politics would be taken like that. There is no Jai Shri Durga, Jai, Jai, Jai Mata Durga, or Jai Mata Kali or anything as part of the Bengali political lexicon. So we find it rather odd. I mean, it might be sweeping crowds in the Gangetic belt. And if it's not there, if you're not succeeding in making them soon, it's your issue, baby. On that basis then, sir, I mean, if I can take the other point of view, then the Banerjee's insistence on this, this division of insider and outside is likely to backfire on her. Because the voter in Bengal is going to say that this is too much of a highlight from the local leader. And it is the prevailing situation in the country. And that therefore, there's nothing wrong in the BJP in that sense. Because it's not so much, you know, religious based icons that are being used. But it's actually, you know, an attempt to make the the point that um, uh, Mamata Banerjee is talking about, that it's actually a, a chimera, this whole sub-nationalist dialogue of hers. So, I mean, on that point of view, she's perhaps digging her own grave. Isn't that right? She's taking a gamble by raising the issue. If she were a little more sophisticated, she would not raise it. She would let the people take a call as to whether the entire campaign should be led by stars from some other state, whether the entire campaign in a local state should be in another language, whether the icons are to be used in politics, a la North India or a la 
uh, in style with tandem with many parts of India in a state that has never done this sort of politics. So people could take a call. She did not have raised it and faced his accusations. She is trying to capitalize as any local leader would. <laughs> we have no love lost and I still consider her quite autocratic. But the fact is on the issue of secularism, the one that we are missing, missing, missing out, we cannot put a finger, we cannot ever blame the three parties of Bengal. The Congress has been thoroughly secular, continues to remain secular. It doesn't play around with soft Hindutva as some young uh, inherited leader does in North India. It remains very secular in Bengal, uh, Congress or whatever exists of it. The left front, the Marxists, have been more than staunchly secular. They continue to remain secular, though their existence is at peril. And the Trinamool Congress has also been extremely secular, extremely secular. So there, the only party that, re that relates to religion stands out like a sore thumb or stands out like a beautiful thumb or a yellow thumb or a saffron thumb. So it stands out, number one. And now coming to that, I'm making it sound as if there are no people who believe in Hindutva politics in Bengal. No, 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 that's not correct. The Hindu nationalism arose in large part from Bengal. You must remember that in the 19th century, nationalism in Bengal, which was one of the earliest state to raise this new fashion word, was equated with Hinduism. And those who raised this issue, like Vankim Chandra Chattopadhyay and others, never made a distinction between the Hindu and the nationalist. So, but that was the way their worldview. They were not accusing the Muslim of being anti-national. Are you getting my point? The Muslim, educated Muslim, was nowhere around. And therefore, since nationalism was being discussed in educated circles, it was equated everyone around was a Hindu, uh, maybe a couple of educated Muslims. Perhaps a great time to come in and ask you that, that third limb of, you know, depending on what we've looked at, the, this next limb of the issues is the retreat from politics of the Bhadralok. Right. Which is uniquely Bengali. Right. That whole concept. If you could help unpack that a little bit, perhaps we can understand this issue a little more. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned Bankim Chandra, because I think we're now leading up to that question. How did this educated Badrulok who had participated so actively and widely in public affairs, that retreat is creating a space perhaps now. To understand this phenomena, we'll again have to understand what the word Badrulok means. It's a term very unique to Bengal and it represents something that most people in India would find extremely surprising. It is actually a conglomerate of three to four castes. And this conglomerate of the three to four upper castes happened so organically, so naturally and have bonded so well, so well. What happened was in the late medieval period, you know, Bengal was the first state to come under Muslim rule along with the Delhi Sultanate. I mean, the, the area of the Delhi Sultanate. It was the first province to be governed by the Muslims outside of Delhi. And it remained so till the Battle of Plassey when the British took over. So Bengal has a long history of being subjugated or hegemonized or ruled by Muslims not necessarily a bitter history. This is one point people fail to understand. I wouldn't say that the Bengali Brahmin and the Bengali Kaist or the Bengali Vaidha were, were in raptures or were enjoying the fact that the Muslims are ruining. No, they had their own misgivings about it. But then there were opportunities given to them within the framework. Capturing, uh, capitalizing on these opportunities three of the upper castes decided or came together without deciding. And this, these three upper castes are the Brahmins, the Vaidya Brahmins, it's a class of Bengali Brahmins, and the Kaistas, which is basically an indigenous group that pretends to be like the Kaistas of North India, but basically an educated 
task engaged in accounts and administration. These three castes put together do not constitute more than 6% of the entire people of Bengal, Muslims included. 6%. And this 6% have held their hegemony in education, in professions, and in even in business and government, of course, as well. I had passed on an example once that 6% was holding as high as 80% of the government posts in British India. 6%. So when you talk of hegemony, you normally refer to Brahmins in some states, Rajputs in other states. And normally the so-called upper caste in most states are at each other's throats. They are on mode, competition mode. Here, the three upper castes got in seamlessly to form a camaraderie, a, a club, a club of sorts. Intermarriages took place also. I mean, it's it's something very peculiarly Bengali. Okay. Having said that, this group also monopolized land, education, and everything. At some point of time, they would have to give up. It's very strange that even the leadership of the Communist Party was provided by them. So the party that you thought would be ousting them was actually led by the Bhadradogs. We have had not one chief minister from 1947 to 2021 who is not a Brahmin or a Vaidya or a Kayasta. So what casteism are you talking about? You have, it's all kept within the first three. Even the most subaltern chief minister, if I may use the term, the most subaltern chief minister that we have had in Bengal's Bhadralok history, in fact, she militates sometimes against the concept of Bhadralok itself, is uh, Mamta Banerjee. She is also Banerjee. She also comes from the same car. So there is a strange stranglehold that this group has. No, no, because the the challengers are also whatever part of the local leadership of the BJP that we have is still again from the same group. Okay, but having said that, let me not exaggerate it in the sense that though the top leadership and the top control continued to remain and continues to remain uh, without protest almost, there's been considerable participation by other castes. Over the years, from 1947 after partition, there's been considerable participation by other castes. In other words, when you walk along, let us say, the Calcutta Medical College, you would find 50 years ago, people from only these three castes in the rank of professors or surgeons or what have you. Now you have a fair mix. They are there, but almost half the others are from other castes. So they continue to remain, uh, let us say, do well, but a large part from other castes have also joined in. So there is this Madhradok, non Madhradok confrontation is for some reason a non-issue. I wish Ramon or Lohia came over to the state and brought in this caste war. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And as I told you, the largest part of the Bengali depressed groups just walked over to Islam to form 66% of the Bengali population, leaving another 20% within Hinduism. So that comes to about 86% of the population. It's only around the remaining 15% that we talk of caste in the middle caste and upper caste and all that. Are you getting the picture? Absolutely. In fact, in fact, that's a good segue into two other points. As uh, You mentioned it in the context of the Bhadralok. But the obliteration of the left in Bengal as we see it today, what does that mean? Have we fully understood what its disappearance effectively from the electoral scene is? And I think the other one, which is linked to this question, is uh, the issue of money power against uh, a traditional muscle power that I think in many cases I've heard it read and said that the Thakish elements merely moved over from one party to the other. And, you know, they perhaps are doing that again this time in the electoral politics. So, I mean, those two questions is what does the obliteration of the left mean? And where do you see money versus muscle power in this in, in this election? And I would like to also add a third issue, actually, as we get into the last segment, is what about economic issues like unemployment or farmer crisis? If, if there is an agricultural crisis in, in Bengal, I'm not so sure. Perhaps you can enlighten us on that. 
and the whole economic situation uh, in Bengal. So there are three issues there actually. The left, money power versus muscle power and economic issues. If I can, you know, lay them out and have you come in, Jorda, that would be, you know, very good to move towards the last session. The first one strikes everyone who, every political analyst, how could the left disappear almost altogether? The left got not one assembly segment out of 294 in the last polls of 2019. And they ruled the state for 34 years practically without challenge. What happened? Well, number one, the way communists go, they don't move away by a revolution because they come through, they, they claim to come through revolution. They move away by implosion. The structure is such that there is a sudden implosion and that happens to most regimented parties and can very well happen to another regimented party also. Uh, it just implodes because you insulate yourself from reality. You are so busy in your own ideological make-believe world that when reality hits you, it hits you like double-dose corona. And you've gone. COVID. You've gone. So the decline of the left is astounding, number one. But the left played a role in the post-left regimes coming in. It's very interesting as a, as a student of social history to explain. The left consolidated and empowered and enriched a group that what was daringly dismissed in Bengal as the clerical group the lower middle class group. The lower middle class was obviously looked down upon by the upper, upper caste in Bengal saying that, oh, they are all karmacharis, they are cler clerical, they are semi-educated and they don't have property. This class was the class from which the communist leadership came. They were more educated at times, better educated than their opponents in the upper caste. And they consolidated this lower middle class, if I may put it rather crudely, they consolidated the lower middle class and empowered them to the extent that they stayed for 34 years. Within the womb of this class rose another class, and that is the aspirational lower middle class, the no holds barred lower middle class, the globalized consumerist lower middle class that was not going to listen to the sermons of Marx and Hegel uh, first thing in the morning. Their fathers were have-nots. The sons came out as must-haves. You get my point? It's from the have-nots to the must-haves. And the must-haves found the communists very boring. The must-haves found that now that they had that the fridge and the TV and the cooker and, and the microwave and everything in, in the house, and they were a worker family, don't worry. So having got all that, they must get the latest one. Their, their Maruti car was certainly not what suited them, and they broke off. And this is the class that actually gained from the no holds barred EMC regime. The TMC is a combination of a desperate middle class, an aspirational middle class, and the subaltern. The subaltern, the urban subaltern and the rural subaltern. People who are not bothered about the fine methods of grammar and spelling while speaking. People who aren't highly educated, but occupied in some profession. That huge group, which is at the bottom of the, at, at the, placed the pyramid below the lower middle class and therefore more sizable in number, they allied with the desperate elements that came out. And why am I using the term desperate? They were very enterprising as well. I may not like their mannerisms or wearing gold chains and things like that, but the fellows on motorbike had it in them. They had more fire in their belly and in their engine than their agitating fathers with red flags had. So this class has taken over and now the BJP banks primarily on this class itself. The BJP cannot create any further class space. It is this class that the communists would dismiss as lumpens. It is this class on which the BJP also banks. 
It's a very clear issue. Yeah. That that actually sums it up for the left, really. That's what they've lost out, right? Yes. So that these were the two. And the last part was the economic decline. Before the economic yes. decline, sir, may I just ask you to address this issue of money power in the context of of the demise of the left and the growth of the BJP, the issue of money power, and of course, the earlier muscle power that used to exist. You know, the, the fact that I think you said they, the left was in power virtually without any kind of uh, opposition because they uh, quite literally browbeat people into, into acceptance, right? And that might be said even of this current regime in Bengal. Um, and how has that changed with the BJP coming in with obviously a lot of more money being pumped in? I mean, look at Karnataka as a good example, since you mentioned it at the start, the kind of government making and undoing that you can do with, uh, with a lot of money. Uh, I'll split the two questions. First, I'll talk of muscle power broaden it out to violence in politics. Now, remember, the holy tradition of violence in politics was created in Bengal. Throughout the colonial period, when the British were looking for martial races, they fast forwarded Bengal. I mean, they just skipped Bengal. They had a couple of regiments named after Bengal, but that consisted of people from neighboring states. The Bengali was not famous for his hard labor, was not very famous for his muscle. Okay. And he started accepting it. Started accepting. Vivekananda actually started a lot of what you call gymnasium so that they pick up some muscles as well. Wasn't a roaring success and it goes on. So it's known as the people who are not martial and the whole series. They are the first ones who realize that you don't need muscles to fight an unequal war. A bomb or a pistol is good enough. So terrorism as a part of national politics starts from Bengal, the cult of killing, the cult of fascination. It is known as Swadeshi in Bengal, the Swadeshi phase, and it's iconized. That period of terrorism was found its greatest roots in Bengal because they'd be more comfortable with a gun than taking on with a, let us say, a sock. Fisticuffs was not the favored weapons. If I have a gun, I'll use it. So the cult of violence came in and was glamorized, valorized, iconized. After that came in the broad scale Congress politics of non-violence and Bengal had its very uncomfortable relation with Mahatma Gandhi. They weren't very sure how this person comes in and says they don't use violence, etc. But then Immediately after the partition, uh, incidentally, we never say independence in Bengal. It's always known as partition because what mattered more to Bengal was that they were partitioned. So immediately after 1947 partition came up classes who took up to the gut again. The aggression got bottled into the communist movement and it was kept bottled that way for about 20 years. 47 to 67, they kept it bottled, more or less, with uh, bottled aggression was there. 1967, as you know, came out the Naxalites. And since then, Bengal's contribution to Indian politics has been left-wing extremism. So we have this cult of violence there, and political killings are, well, there. It's not a non-violent state in that sense, even last night, a minister has been badly hurt and the day before a CPIM or a left front protest was halted near the state secretariat and one person beaten to death. So this, this is something of a characteristic that we have to live with unless there's some regime that can purge it out. But the regime that claims to purge it out is so full of violence itself that we did not extend this part of the conversation. So the other part is money power. To use money power, you need money. Where is big money in Bengal? You see, the in industries of the British that it inherited, the industries set up by the Marwadis and others as well. I mean, they took up, took them up more than uh, set up. Investment set up by pioneering Bengalis and all that is all part of history. They're out in history books. But perhaps that money is coming in now from outside. 
you know another outsider uh, element okay so the question of money being influential in bengal politics was never an issue because there never much of it to go around the, the small time money was made from sand pilfering from the river beds and you know hack money it doesn't have a single mineral so how can you get a granite king when there is no granite so you don't have a mineral king you don't have these resources all of a sudden money has started flowing in and i would put it without fear of contradiction that this money is being pumped in from outside a huge amount of money is being pumped in from outside and this money cannot be clean money it cannot be na khaunga na khilaunga bani it can't be so and this money is disrupting bengal's politics to the sense that as you know mlas have become the most favored commodities i mean they, they may be listed in the commodities exchange also too so all over india it happened in your state well i mean karnataka is a good example of this yeah so the karnataka politics the the or rather the, the karnataka style the madhya pradesh style of buying up people usko bhav kitna khareed lo just buy him over has come into bengal it is done by one party the other party is not of uh, consist does not consist of saints the other major party also has what it uh, what we call its its collectors one of the reason for industrialization not taking place in the last 15 20 years is that while these industrial conventions were held and they were invited the moment they went and occupied tried to occupy the land they came across strange looking people who said i belong to the party where is my cut so that dissuaded businessmen from sort of investing much and whoever was investing even in the last 15 20 years i hear horror stories that motorbikes would stop at the factory and said where is our money so they tried to build a dry emaciated cow too much and they killed the golden goose so there was no industrial or not much of trading money to go around these truck loads of money are coming from the epitome of the honest regime somewhere outside bengal and they are buying up mlas and mps like the stock market and potentially also sir i would take it that they are probably buying votes uh, is that also happening i think this time it will happen because there's so much money god only knows where it's collect- collected from which airport contract gives them so much money i mean what does it know which shipping contract or which uh, telecom contract gives them so much money and in the context of an employment and a general economic situation which isn't the great uh, yeah absolutely uh, this time uh, we won't be surprised if votes and notes become interchangeable we we won't be surprised because there's so much money it is obscene for you to just step back and perhaps in conclusion give us an overview as i said not necessarily a predictive analysis of who wins what and how much how many seats but what does this election mean for the state and for india as a whole see you have to look at the way india has emerged outside the hardcore uh, hindi belt there has been a steady move to homogenize india which is antithetical to its very plural existence its plurality is not one of philosophy its plurality is one of utility this this simple fact can't be drilled too deep into people whose education qualifications are not well known okay so there is this homogenization that has taken is taking place and contrary to this homogenization are standing out certain states punjab for instance is one extreme state that stands out kerala has stood out has withstand tamil nadu does it but one is not very sure how bitter is antagonism or how user friendly is the politics one is not very sure assam was also one more extreme and bengal continued to be one of the most virulent 
uh, states that is opposed to any degree of centralization and homogenization. One reason could be Bengal was hardly ever ruled for the center. When I talked of Islamic rule, most of it was in Bengal itself. And in other words, uh, not from Delhi. Yes, the Mughals ruled from Agra, but that was another phase. So Bengal always had this thing that we are not exactly step in step. Every festival is different. It's Diwali for the whole of India. It's a festival of light. And for Bengali, it is a festival of darkness, Kali Puja. Uh, you call it Holi, they call it Dol. They do it one day before, one day after. So some reason, this peculiar thing has remained. And uh, this sort of diversity, if it keeps them happy, what's wrong with it? Now, this thing, this identity that we can be... Unis bees. I mean, I don't need to be 20 all the time. I can also be 19 or 21. This thing keeps people, gives people that cultural comfort. There is a deliberate attempt to trample it. So if it evokes a, some sort of a cultural response, don't let's jump and brand it along the mainstream media and call it parochialism and all that. It, it's just a natural reaction. So why, what's your problem if I stay one day different, one, one, one step different? I mean, we are as Indian and we are as national, as patriotic as everyone else. So this identity, this urge to be this, this philosophy of remaining a little distant, this is this reason why the state has been away from the central politics for 44 years. The whoever is in the center, I've written about it so many times. I don't know whether it's a genetic propensity of the voters. They have to vote somebody who is not there in the center. And then begins the tamasha between the central government and the state government that I've been seeing practically after kindergarten. We are probably either looking at a period of some instability and uncertainty or actually a merger between interests of center and state here. If the BJP does manage to come into power, then uh, uh, you're seeming to suggest that the absence of the BJP on coming to power, that is, if it doesn't come to power, there may well be instability. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, much depends on the on the outcome, uh, you know, how many number of seats go this way or that way. But are we looking at some period of uncertainty in, in Bengal? See, first of all, it's going to be a very tough fight. As I talked to you on the 18th, there are two deaths in the last two days. This election will go on till at least the 18th of May. So we have four months left. These four months are not a question of just speculation or analysis. On the ground, there's this charged violence. Violence and Violence by people who are MA PhDs in violence on both sides. They've got their doctorates in violence. So no party, and I insist on this, no party, neither the Trinamool nor the BGP nor the left can turn around and say that the other guy hit me. If you look around and catch the accuser by the collar, his hands are stained in blood. So there's no question of any party saying the other. I mean, they're equally bad, all of them. So we have a tense period coming up. And I've already said that there's some round of background legitimation of violence. So we go through this, number one. So there'll be deaths. Number two, there'll be a lot of money pumping in. I fear that communal riots may be ignited only to instill identity politics, to sharpen identity. It doesn't matter to Machiavellian politicians to let a uh, hundred persons die or 20 persons die, because if they think by repercussion, they'll get be able to consolidate votes. They've done it with aplomb. They've done it so many times. So that is another fear. At the end of it, the Bengali voter has to take a choice. And when I use the word Bengali, I'm not meaning the ethnically Bengali. For God's sake, one third of the people here have come in recently from outside. I'm recently in the last 100, 200, 200 years from outside. So whoever believes in that culture, whoever believes in that ethos, it is up to them, A, to preserve 
the heritage of the mind, B, the heritage where one can talk of all religions, celebrate all festivals, and yet remain intrinsically plural, this plurality, the sense of decency that you mentioned as Bhadralok, the sense of being autonomous, a little different. All these are under challenge. All these are under challenge. And whatever Mamta Banerjee may be screaming in her own uh, shrill voice, I mean, she's no less autocratic anyway. Having said that, Mamta Banerjee is only a catalytic factor. Now it is up to the people of Bengal to take a choice. To take a choice. They have been different. They have not allowed the BGP to come in for various reasons, good and bad. Let us see whether they allow it to rule Bengal. Either or, we cannot challenge the democratic mandate. A personal opinions cannot stand before the voters' choices. So we can't have personal tastes coming in, in the way. Let us see what the voter does. But what I foresee in the short run is just too bad, is bad. Well, we, we do hope, uh, Mr. Sarkar, that that uh, certainly doesn't pan out that way and that this election is peaceful and you know democratic in its outcome. But it's been a fascinating session talking to you. Thank you so very much uh, and uh, appreciate your uh, time and inputs, which have been very erudite and uh, well received. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening in till the end. Please share this episode with a friend on social media, WhatsApp or anywhere else. It would mean the world to us. And in case you're listening via iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. Subscribe to BIC Talks on email or your favorite podcast app and don't miss out on future episodes. This episode of BIC Talks has Gaurav Krishna as our sound engineer with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Lekha Naidu. And the accompanying episode artwork was made by Chandni Venkataraman. Thank you for listening to this episode of BIC Talks. This podcast can be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org, as well as on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune in for new episodes every week and do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages to stay informed on our latest updates. Music